All right, a couple of weeks ago I finished my series that I was on, and I think I'm, we'll see what happens. You, I'm a series guy, what can I say? Uh, but I, I'm going to do some individual messages that I've been wanting to do, and so uh, I think this is very timely this morning, and I want you to leave here this morning, um, I always want you to leave here with a sense of peace knowing that God loves you. Um, however, I, I, I want that to be upped a little bit this morning. I want you to leave this place with a real sense of peace. And I think you'll see why as I begin to share this morning. Uh, the title of my message is Waking, Awakening to the Peace Within. And let me just say this. I believe that there is an awakening going on all over the planet. Just like Robin said, there's people saying all kinds of things, and, and um, I, I think that people have thresholds of belief. There's certain things that people can embrace, and there's other things they can't embrace yet, and that's okay. Um, I believe that as we continue to move forward, things are going to be easier and easier to see, and things are going to be easier and easier for us to walk those out in our lives because we're going to be uh, more dependent on uh, what is within us or who is within us than what is going on around us. We are in a season, elections are on Tuesday, we're in a season around us on the outside of great turmoil. Uh, this year has been been a year of turmoil. I think there's a number of reasons for that, and I'm not going to go into that this morning, but uh, I believe we're in a season right now where we can make a real difference if we understand the peace that is within us. And whenever we are, I, I believe all of us are awakening to that peace, but whenever we begin to allow that peace to flow out, us, out of us, in, in our lives and everything that we do and everything that we say. I believe that Jesus did that. Jesus uh, said, I only do those things that I see my Father do. I only say those things that I hear my Father say. So there was an, an, an incredible thing that Jesus was doing on the planet. He was trying to get us uh, to have revelation of who we are and that we could walk and act just like Him. Not from a performance mindset like the old covenant presented to us, but from a new covenant mindset. It was like Jake said last week, it, it, was, it was new to them. It, it's not new to us. The reality is, and I've been saying this here lately, the reality of the new covenant is it's kainos. Yes, it, was, it, it's, it may be new to somebody today, but the reality is, is that's the way that God has always operated toward us. He's always loved us. He's always accepted us. He's always embraced us. And so whenever we begin to awaken to the peace within, it causes a real disruption of the things that we've believed. It causes a real disruption uh, to our doctrines that we've held to. And uh, I'm going to start reading here in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 and 7, very familiar scripture. It says, for unto, us, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, everybody say Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace... There will be no end. And it's an inner government. It's an inner peace. It is He Himself living and dwelling in us that will come from the inside out. We're not going to change things from governmental policies. We're going to change things from an increase of His government within us. We're going to change things from an increase of His peace within us. And to his, to this government and this peace, there will be no end. And it goes on to say, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it 
and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And I believe that that's what God is doing. The inner peace that we have never changes because Christ Jesus never changes. Our response to that peace, our awareness of that peace, our consciousness of that peace is definitely changing in our, in our moment like never before. Experiencing the peace of God, experiencing the person of peace is affected by what we believe, our theology. But it has to become more than theology, like Jake was talking about last week. It has to, it has to enter into the practical and relational side. It has to be uh, operative in our lives. And whenever I say operative, it's an automatic outflow. It's not something you do. It's something that you're aware of, and the more aware you are of it, the, the more increase of flow that begins to transpire out of you. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. It has to get into our practical box. It has to get into our relational box, just like it did with Jesus. Whenever they hung Him on a cross, He said, you know, before that in the garden, He said, listen, or He told Pilate specifically, He said, Listen, if, uh, if my kingdom was of this world, then would not my disciples fight and defend it? And so, Jesus' kingdom is a different kingdom. There's different parameters to it. And we're in the most uh, incredible, the last 10, 20 years have been the most incredible theological shift in, in preachers' minds all over the planet, but I believe that it's going on uh, in not only in, in ministry, but it's going on within everyone. And um, I believe that the reason why the people haven't experienced it is because us preachers didn't know how to explain it to you. Come on. But things are opening up more and more every day. And as Robin, as, Robin and I was talking about this yesterday... You know, it, it has to get in our relationship box. It has to get into our practical box. This peace that I'm talking about. It has, to, it has to begin to impact our emotions and the way we respond in everyday life. It isn't... Listen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, things aren't going to change around us until we become aware of the oneness and the union that we have with Christ, that we have with Papa on the inside, and He's never in turmoil. You and I might be. How many of you have been in turmoil in the last two years? I give you a little break there. But see, that's not, that's not even you. That's, look, look at somebody and say, that's not even you. That turmoil is, is out, of a, out, out of something else that's trying to invade your thinking and the way that you're operating. The real you is always at peace. And if we begin to tap into that, and I believe we are, I believe we are like never before, because here's the thing, w w experiencing peace in my life is directly proportional to my theology. And let me, let me just say it real bluntly and real plainly. Um, well, I won't say that, but I thought that. Um, Paul said it like this in Philippians, that the things that he believed was a pile of scabola. I w was using a very nice word. You know, he even put up all of his credentials on the wall like a pile of doo-doo. Because he wanted to be found in Christ. He wanted, he wanted this union to not only be experienced by him, but he wanted, he wrote about it. He wanted everybody to embrace this love and this peace. Whenever your doctrines begin to change, you know, I've noticed... You know, I think it was about two years ago whenever I taught the 14-week series on uh, raising hell. And I've noticed since that time 
that even in my life, and it was before, I, I began seeing that nine years ago or ten years ago whenever my eschatology changed, whenever I realized that the Bible wasn't written to us, it was written for us, and I saw that Jesus only used the word Gehenna referring to a literal place. I saw that imme- almost immediately, and I had to stand up here every week and not let that out because there wouldn't have been anybody left, let's just face it. If I, if I would have said that nine or ten years ago, Davey, I don't even know if you would have been okay with that. Maybe, maybe you would have. I don't know. I'm just being honest here. See, we have thresholds of belief that say, okay, well, God is only this good. Oh, no, He's better. He's better. We just, he's better because we've been taught things that led us down a rabbit hole of darkness, ignorance, and death. But I'm going down a rabbit hole of life that never ends. It never stops. And so, and so yet, whenever you begin, whenever you let go of certain doctrines that make God really look bad, you realize, oh my God, He is really a God of peace. He really loves me. And it begins to get down in your emotions. I can feel it going down into my emotions, you know, like those things on Star Trek, those bugs, and they put that thing in somebody's ear, and, you know, it's, it's getting in there. You say, what's getting in there? The gospel, the good news, the love of God, the peace of God, and now I can feel it. It's starting to rule my life and to rule my emotions. Am I perfect at it? No, because I had 50 years of scabola dropped into me. And so, so it takes time. But at what I'm saying this morning is, is I want you to understand that the government, of, uh, his government and the increase of his peace, there will be no end to this. We are going to continue to move. What I want to do is give you hope. I want to give you peace this morning. We're, we're moving into everything that God has said has been ours all along. Let me give you a definition of peace. I think this is out of Wikipedia It says, peace refers to a deliberate state of psychological or spiritual calm despite the potential presence of stressors. The opposite of being stressed or anxious is peace of mind. I love that. In the, middle of, in the middle of stress going on all around us, and I don't know if you've noticed, this year has been a real year of stress. Regardless of what's going on around us, you know, there's people that I'm trying to talk to. I've quit trying to make people believe what I believe. You can, you can get on my bandwagon or you can get off my bandwagon. I will love you no matter where you're at in your journey. I will be respectful to you, know where you're at. Because the more you increase in the government of God and the government of peace, the more respectful you will be to others who don't believe like you do. I'm preaching to myself this morning. Thank you. (laughs) Shalom is is the Hebrew word for peace. And this word means harmony, peace, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, and tranquility. So what I want to do this morning is I want to bring you into an awareness, into a consciousness of this peace. And the reality is... And I think, I think we've been doing a pretty good job around here delving into the love of God. And the more you delve into the love of God, you've got to let bad doctrines go. You can't continue to preach love the way that we preach it and not let go of some of our doctrines. And some of the way that we've looked at things. Galatians 5.22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and here is the, here's the automatic byproduct of you ingesting your mind and your emotions into a life of love. 
Listen, and there's all kinds of people in my life right now that are at different levels of what they think and what they say. And, you know, I'm at this point, I'm listening to all of them, but I'm taking heed how I'm ingesting what they're saying because some of them are not embracing the love of God the way that I'm embracing the love of God. And I think they might be a little inaccurate on some things. Come on, look at somebody and say everybody's a little inaccurate on some things. The more you go into the heights and the depths and the breadths and the lengths of His love, you're going to have to change some of the things that you think and the way you operate. I used to say that I would rather go to a church that preaches law and models love. Now, now listen to me. I would rather go to a church that preaches law and models love. That's what I used to say. I, I don't want to go to a church that models law and preaches love. But I don't want either one of those things to be right. I want to go to a church and be a part of a community of people that preaches love and models it. Yeah. Doing both. So the fruit of the Spirit is love. And the first thing that comes whenever you begin to ingest yourself into the love of God, into the, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And the automatic byproducts are joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. There's nothing that can... Uh, there's no law, there's no performance that you can do to make it happen. There's an awareness that comes that you realize that this is who you are, this is, this is who God is, this is who you are. You are wall-to-wall -wall love from the tips of your toe to the top of your head. And the automatic byproduct of all of your doctrines and all of your theology being enveloped by the love of God, the first thing that comes is joy. Whenever I realized that nobody was going to burn eternally, that brought such great joy to my heart. Now, I have talked to some Christians in the last couple of years that they were really kind of pissed off because they want some people to pay for what they did. And Jake kind of threw that one out the window last week, didn't it? Look at somebody and say, I don't want anybody to have to pay. See, see the realization of, of some of this stuff, it begins to cause great joy to come into your heart. And I, I don't want to put that joy down. I will, it will always be resident within me, but I want to operate in it. I want to model it. I, want it. I don't want it to just be on the inside. I want it to be evident to everyone on the outside. The byproduct of understanding that God, is in, that God is love and that we are in union and one with that love is the first two things is joy and peace. And I'm talking about peace this morning. When you, when you begin to understand who God is and who you are, it will produce joy and peace in your life. And that joy and peace will be like, I believe it's Isaiah 26 that says, joy, that joy and that peace will be like a dipper that you use to dip down on the inside of you to all of the things that you've been given that pertains unto life and godliness, you'll begin to draw out that, uh, that whatever need that you might have in this moment, you'll begin to draw that out because of the joy and the peace that's coming as a response of your theology going deep into the love of God and all of your doctrines changing to line up with that. I like that. So this is what... Romans 14, 17 says out of the New King James. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, not eating and drinking, not based, up, uh, not based upon performance, not based upon a set of rules, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When your fears are addressed by understanding the love of God, it will produce joy. It will produce peace. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and out of that love comes joy and peace. Not your love for God, but God's love for you. You in being enveloped by it. You beginning to understand it. You beginning to embrace it to where it is affecting your emotions. Joy and peace comes out. 
You know what, you know what I had to do this morning? I was so energized this morning by the Spirit of God. I was just bouncing off. The, I had to work out before I came to church. I got on my bike and, and worked out a little bit because I wanted to kind of be a little... This is so exciting to me. This is exciting to me to believe that God is at peace with me. He's always been at peace with me. He is the Prince of Peace. And I may not have always been at peace with myself or with Him, but I'm, I'm entering into that. I'm, my mind is changing and embracing that, and that is extremely exciting. Look at somebody and say, I'm excited. So, so let me... I believe that, like Luke 179 says... Um, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our way into to guide our way into the way of peace the way of peace was being born into the earth and John was prophesying about him coming the way of peace the way of peace he's going to show us the way of peace that has always existed but we were in ignorance we were in darkness we didn't understand it. When your fears are addressed by understanding His love toward your life personally, it will produce peace. Everybody say peace. So I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation here, uh, out of uh, Mark chapter 4. And I wasn't going to read this whole thing, but I think I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it. And I believe God's going to speak to you as I read it. I want to get to the end. There's a couple of things that I want to say maybe in between, but um, let me just say this. Jesus taught in parables, word pictures. He did that, I believe, to stimulate and open the minds of the Jewish people to a new way of thinking. I believe, he still, I believe that that still happens to us, but, but the reality is Jesus was talking to Jewish people who were under an old covenant performance-based system that they created, God got in the box, and, and Jesus was trying to take them out of that box and bring them into a new covenant, and He was doing that with word pictures. He did that to stimulate and open the minds of Jewish people to a new way of thinking. I believe that we can have a new way of thinking too. He wanted to break their performance-based view of an angry God. He wanted, them to, he wanted to introduce them to a new way of looking at God and a new way of looking at themselves. The truth is, I know you hear me say it all the time, we were never, as a Gentile, I was never under the law. Matter of fact, I was born 2,000 years after the law went off the scene. We've never been under law. We've never been under the performance of law, but because we've mixed uh, Old Covenant principles and New, New Testament principles together, we've come up with some weird stuff. Like Robin and I said Wednesday night, uh, it, doctrines outside of grace will carry you into strange and various places and will leave you emotionally scarred. And Rob and I talked about this quite a bit last night, actually. If Jesus spoke to their bad doctrine directly, if He would have just said, this is the way that it is, boys, they wouldn't have got it. He had to gently lead them and stimulate them to begin to question things that they had always believed. Jesus, a lot of times, He wouldn't give answers. He would... He would he would answer uh, statements with questions because he wanted to stimulate people's thinking. Sometimes if we speak to bad doctrine, like I remember Terry Bench about 10 years ago sitting in a, in a very full service here, uh, I said, I just said out loud that uh, the rapture was not, a, was not a biblical concept. And we had a family that was sitting right there. All of them got up and walked out the back door. Now, that is saying too much too quickly. But I want everybody to know the truth. Now, people are watching online, but if they don't like what I'm saying, they can just click me off. If you're sitting in here and you don't like what I'm saying, I would appreciate it if you wouldn't walk out. But 
are you seeing what I'm saying? So, uh, I, I want to say things, but I, I, I want to I wanna say things that, um, that stimulates your thinking. This isn't about me. What if I am gone tomorrow? I, I'm just asking a question. So this isn't about me. This is about us. And you say, Pastor, Sir, are you going somewhere? Hey, listen, things, things happen. Negative things sometimes happen on the planet. No, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> if Jesus would have spoke directly to their bad doctrine with a new way of thinking immediately, they would have rejected it. But because He put it out there, people like uh, Nicodemus who came to him at night, he was starting to get glimpses of some stuff. And, and you know what? It's a lot better. I don't know about you, but it's a lot better in my life, and Robin will be okay with me saying this, it's a lot better in my life if I get her to think that it was her idea and not mine. Come on. And you can quote me on that. So here we go. The Passion Translation, Jesus is uh, in Mark chapter 4. He's talking about the parable of the sower. It says in chapter uh, 4 and verse 10 out of the Passion Translation, Afterwards, Jesus, His disciples and those close to Him remained behind to ask Jesus about His parables. He said to them, The privilege of intimately knowing the mystery of God's kingdom realm has been granted to you but not to the others, where everything is revealed in parables. And again, I believe he was stimulating their thinking. He was not withholding anything from them. He was trying to get them on board. For even when they see, even when they see what I do, they will not understand. And when they hear what I say, they will learn nothing. Otherwise, they would repent and be forgiven. Then he said to them, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any parable? Let me explain. The farmer sows the word as seed, and what falls on the beaten path represents those who hear the word. But immediately Satan appears, and we know that Satan is not a pitchfork guy with a, okay, and snatches it from their hearts. It's our belief system. The seed sown on gravel represents those who hear the word and receive it joyfully. But because their hearts fail to sink a deep root into the Word, they don't endure for long. For when trouble or persecution comes, and remember, Jesus is talking to Jewish people. For when trouble or persecution comes on account of the Word, they immediately wilt and fall away. And the seed sown among thorns represents those who hear the Word, but they allow the cares of this life and the seduction of wealth, and the desires for other things to crowd out and choke the Word so that it produces nothing. He's talking to Jewish people coming out of an old covenant. He's trying to get them into an understanding of new covenant reality. Verse 20, But the seed sown on good soil represents those who open their hearts to receive the Word, and their lives bear good fruit. Some yield a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times more than was sown. Look at somebody and say, a word is powerful in my life. And I'm talking about peace this morning specifically. He also gave them, I'm depositing something in your thought process this morning. He also gave them this parable. No one lights a lamp only to place it under a basket or under the bed. It is meant to be placed on a lampstand for everyone to see. For there is nothing that is hidden that won't be disclosed, and there is no secret that won't be brought out into the light. And I believe he's telling them, you guys, you're coming out of an old covenant. Some of you are going to come into a new covenant. I want all of you to, but I know that all of you won't at this moment in time. He said, if you understand what I'm saying, then you need to respond. I, I love that. If you understand what I'm saying, then you need to respond to it. 
we're not trying to get God to respond to us. We are responding to what has already been true of us all along. We're just responding to it. See, if you don't respond to it, maybe you've got things that have veiled your emotions. Maybe you've been affected emotionally with doctrines and things in your life that is, that is far deeper than you realize. But the truth is, is that the peace of God, the joy of God, the love of God is deeper than any negative thing that you've ever experienced in your life. And God wants to get you down into that hole. Respond. And I love this. Then he said to them, Be diligent to understand the meaning behind everything you hear. For as you do, more understanding will be given to you. I mean, the moment that I accepted that tribulation wasn't out in the future, a great tribulation, and my eschatology, whenever I realized my eschatology was history, it opened me up, it unveiled me to start walking through doors that I would have slapped myself if I would have thought that 15, 20 years ago. To be diligent, to understand the meaning behind everything you hear, for as you do, more understanding will be given to you. And according to the depth of your longing to understand, much more will be added to you in your thinking. For those who listen with open hearts will receive more revelation. You know, sometimes I really believe that it's not even... I I think it is what I say, but it's not just what I say. It's what the Spirit of God says to you in the middle of while I'm talking. Are you understanding me? So that relieves me. I don't have to be perfect up here. Praise the Lord. Oh, that was a real good place to say yes, Pastor Terry. But those who don't listen with open hearts will lose what little they even think they have. In other words, you're not, you're not staying still. You're either moving forwards or you're going backwards. We sing a song like that. You're either moving forward or you're going backwards. You may be going a little step at a time back or you may be, going, or you may be taking off and running. And some people can't handle the threshold of someone changing from the way they believe this to the way they believe this in a short period of time. Some people's thresholds, they can't handle it. And that, so that's why the kingdom of God, whenever we talk about the new covenant, whenever we talk about the kingdom of God that has always existed, it has been within us, the kingdom of God gives people the opportunity to move at their own pace. And so I'm moving at my own pace but I've got, to, I've got to understand where we are and who I'm talking to out there. Pastor, are there some things you want to say? I think I'm saying about everything that I can say right at the moment. Are there more things that I'm going to say? Everybody look at somebody and say yes. But here's the deal. And, and I think I heard, I can't remember who I heard say this actually. But whenever we begin to change our thinking on things, and we begin to move forward. Sometimes some of us run so fast that we don't have time to put it in the oven, uh, to cook it to where it's operative in our lives. In other words, I'm way down here in my theology, but my practical and my relational vehicle is way back there. I'm hurting people I, I'm, God loves me and God loves you, but I'm still doing things outside of the relational and practical box. My theology is getting really good, but man, I'm not walking in anything that I'm understanding because I haven't had time for it to cook in the oven. I'm talking about your soul. We've got to give stuff time. You know, I would rather camp out, and I know you guys know me, sometimes I camp out in one spot for a while, and it's like you're repetitive, Pastor. But that's how we learn. That's how we grow. That's how we get it working in our lives. 
because I don't want to have something theologically that I cannot put into effect in my life, in my everyday life. So I love that. That's verse 24 and 25 out of the Passion Translation. I think that's incredible. Verse 26, Jesus also told them this parable, God's kingdom realm is like someone spreading seed on the ground. He goes to bed and gets up day after day. The seed sprouts and grows tall, though he knows not how. All by itself, and the soil produces a crop. First the green stem, then the head on the stalk, then the fully developed grain in the head. Then when the grain is ripe, he immediately puts the sickle to the grain because harvest time has come. And there is so much in here, I, but I want to get down to the verses that, uh, where Jesus is in the bottom of the boat. Then when the grain is ripe, he immediately puts the sickle to the grain because harvest time has come. Everybody look at somebody and say, harvest time is here. And he told them this parable. How can I describe God's kingdom realm? Let me illustrate it with this parable. In other words, all of these things should have been, should have been drawing then out of that old covenant performance-based system into the kingdom of God that Jesus made statements like the kingdom of God is within you. He told that to Pharisees and Sadducees who weren't embracing even what he was saying. How can I describe God's kingdom realm? Let me illustrate it with this parable. It is like the mustard seed, the tiniest of all seeds, yet when it springs up and grows, it becomes the largest plant in the garden. And with so many enormous spreading branches, even birds can nest in its shade. Wow. Jesus used many parables such as these as he taught the people, and they learned according to their ability to understand. He never spoke to them without using parables because he was wanting to bring them along. He didn't want to crush them and not have them accept the things that he was saying. He spoke to them. He never spoke to them without using parables, but would wait until they were alone, the disciples, before he explained the meaning to them. And then it says in verse 35, and here's where I want to get this morning. Later that day, and I want you to understand something, is that Jesus not only taught things, but He was constantly modeling things. He was constantly teaching, and He was constantly modeling. I believe He was constantly teaching peace. I believe He was constantly teaching love, joy, peace. I believe He was constantly moving people out of the sadness of that old covenant into the new covenant. I believe he was constantly doing that. Now, I believe that this story really happened, but I also believe that there's some things that we can glean out of this metaphorically or symbolically that will really help us in the moment of time that we're in. How many of you want to walk in more peace this week than you walked in last week? How many of you want to shut off your news this week and keep your mind stayed on peace this week? I would suggest that highly. Later that day, after it grew dark, Jesus said to his disciples, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. Jesus was putting into effect what he had been teaching. He began to model to them that what he had been teaching, that they could walk that out in their moment. They had words from Jesus, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. And Jesus said that whenever it began to grow dark. Jesus said that because darkness represents ignorance. Jesus said that it was getting dark, and Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. Jesus was about to model peace in the midst of a storm. I don't believe that he was testing them. Let no man say that God tempts, tests, or tries us. I don't believe Jesus was testing them. I believe that he had confidence 
in them that they were going to get it. And sometimes you have to work with a little seven-year-old kid until he can dribble the ball between his legs and behind his back and nobody can get to him. You have to stay with him and work with him. I believe Jesus was doing that. In, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, the unforced rhythms of grace, Jesus said, walk with me and work with me. Stay with me. I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to hang with you until you get this. Wow, that's so powerful to me. So Jesus will get in the middle of your darkness, your ignorance, and speak a word. And sometimes He will use the preacher. Sometimes He will use your kids. Sometimes He will use people at work. But God will speak life into the midst of your darkness. Let's go to the other side. John 16, 33. Jesus talking to them. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now let me, I don't want to make a big deal of this, but let me, let me just say this, that he was talking to them. You and I need to quit expecting tribulation. This wasn't written to us. Yes, is, did he overcome the world? Yes, it's like Jake said last week, we don't live in a fallen world. But if you think you do, then you're going to get the results of that. Later that day it grew dark. Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side. Be of good cheer, Jesus said, for I have overcome the world. Jesus was trying to pull them out of an old covenant, angry God, performance-based mindset into the reality that their father was at peace with them, completely loving them, completely accepting them. And after they had sent the crowd away, they shoved off from the shore with Jesus as he had been teaching from the boat. And there were other boats that sailed with them. And suddenly, as they were crossing the lake, everybody say suddenly, don't you feel like that 2020 was kind of suddenly? But see, just because the elections are coming, the elections are Tuesday, my hope isn't in Donald Trump or Joe Biden. My hope is the kingdom of God is greater within people than a earthly government. So I'm not going to be out of peace if Joe wins. I'm not going to be out of peace if Donald wins. And I've got... Friends and acquaintances on all sides of the ticket. And I'm going to be at peace with everybody no matter what way you vote. I'm going to love you no matter what way you go. Come on now. Well, I'm not going to love, I'm not even going to come to a church that would say something like that. Listen, I've been, I prayed for President Obama. I prayed for George Bush. I prayed for Bill Clinton. I, I pray, it says to pray for all of them. Our hope and our peace is not located in a government. Jesus proved that. Rome was the biggest uh, man-eater that had ever been. See, what I'm doing is I'm wanting in, in, in our... If we have darkness, I want to deposit peace in there this morning. I don't want you to get up Wednesday morning and be in turmoil because of what you see going on in our country, regardless of who wins. Because I am a stabilizer. I am a person of peace. I will stabilize whole sections of the country. If, 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 I, if you understand what I'm saying. But it's not just up to me, it's us. It's the body of Christ. And if you're at peace, you will bring peace to people around you. If you're not at peace, you're going to bring turmoil. I can either, whenever Robin and I are in a disagreement, I can either escalate the situation, and believe me, after living with her for 36 years, being married to her, I just didn't live with her. Um, I thought I'd throw that out. for That's probably a good thing. I know, I know her, and I know what button, buttons to push to escalate the situation. I know none of you ever do that. But I also know how, what to do to decline the situation, to de-escalate the situation. 
So we can either escalate things or we can make things really bad in the days ahead. And I'm believing whether they're bad or good, I'm still going to be in the midst of this peace thing, and I'm going to bring change. So suddenly, as they were crossing the lake, a ferocious tempest arose with violent winds and waves that were crashing into the boat until it was all but swamped. But Jesus was calmly, dude, but Jesus was calmly sleeping in the stern, resting on a cushion. In other words, the boat was swamped with water. I mean, what was Jesus on his little mat floating around in the bottom of the boat? And he was, he was at peace, he was calm. Why? Because he knew the word that he spoke was able to get them to the other side. And he was about to operate in it. He was operating in it. He didn't create the storm either. But he was about to stop it. But Jesus was calmly sleeping in the stern, resting on a cushion. So they shook him awake. Everybody say awake saying, Teacher, don't you even care that we are all about to die? It's almost over. You know, a vast majority of the body of Christ today believes that we're living in the last moments of the last days. Whenever they were, we've asked the wrong question, they were living in the last moments of the old covenant, aeon age. Teacher, don't you even care that we are all about to die? Fully awake, fully awake, fully awake. He rebuked the storm and shouted to the sea, hush, calm down. All at once the wind stopped howling and the waters became perfectly calm. Then he turns to his disciples and said to them, why are you so afraid? Haven't you learned to trust yet? I love that. So here we have a situation that really happened, and Jesus is in the bottom of the boat sleeping. He said, let us go to the other side. Now, if you you understand that they were on the side of the old covenant, performance-based, angry God, blood sacrifice, all the things that we've taught and believed, if you understand that they were on that side of the lake, I think that's the metaphoric meaning of this, let's go to the other side. He was saying, let's go, let's go to the other side. Let's get in the new covenant. Let's, let's, go, to the, let's go to the other side, guys. I don't, I don't think he was just talking about this situation. I think he was talking about going from the old covenant to the new covenant. Let's go to the other side. I would recommend that to you. Let's get out of where we were and move into this structure called peace. That is existent with on the inside of you without you ever doing anything. It's always been there. If, if someone would have told us and, and given us the propaganda that all of this happened in God's time before, the, before time began, then we would have been on a different path. But we're still on a path of growing. Somebody say, I'm not angry with where I'm at. But I'm not staying where I'm at. Jesus was calmly sleeping in the stern, resting on a cushion. Jesus has been calmly sleeping in your boat your whole life. He's been laying on the inside of you. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, kindness. The God of the universe chose to inhabit you before time began. Jesus has been in the bottom of your boat. And we've been trying to awaken him through our scare tactics. Jesus, don't you know we're about to die? No, you're not. That with our souls, that's what we've been begging and trying to get God to help us. And the truth is, he's wanting to awaken on the inside of you. 
He's wanting to awaken. And whenever He awakens within you, then you'll begin to speak to the storms in your life. You're not going to let those things capsize you and take you down. You're going to operate in a place of peace because that's who you are. That's what you have within you. Jesus has always been in your boat. And you may think that you were going under. You may think that you were going down and you were crying out because all of us have done it. God help me, I'm dying, I'm not going to make it. It's, we're not going to be able to make it. And then somebody begins to speak into your life. Somebody, you begin to hear a word that penetrates. Let us go to the other side. Let's not stay where we've been. Let's move into something else. And the moment that you begin to have enlightenment, you begin to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute. I'm not going to die. I'm going to make it through this. I'm going to go to the other side. This has always been within me. The peace of God, the love of God, the joy of God. You've been given everything that pertains unto life and godliness. Philemon verse 6 says, Through the acknowledgement of every good thing in you, in Christ, that your faith, your trust will become effectual and working. It, and look, listen. Yeah, I'm going to say this. Um, I had three people say to the, me this week, nothing is working. Nothing is working. I'm, theologically, I'm coming into all of this stuff, but nothing is working in my life. I can't get anything to work. And this is, this is what I talked to Robin about uh, yesterday. I said, the moment that you say things aren't working, you cover up what is truly working because God's always working. So whenever you tell me and you're speaking that out of your mouth, you're speaking death, you're, you're staying on the other side, starts to speak life. Even if you don't see something working in our government uh, around the world with COVID, don't speak death. Begin to speak from this rabbit hole of grace and love and righteousness and peace. Begin to speak things out of your mouth because you are powerful and you are releasing. You are releasing yourself to see God start working. He's always working, but you'll begin to see it. You'll begin to see the fact that He's working. Everybody say, I've got peace. You do. You have peace. You just need to connect with it. And really, I'll be honest with you, I love preaching and teaching, but the reality of my life is, is that it, it stays theological. I can preach and teach it, but it stays theological until I begin to focus inward. Whenever I begin to focus inward, then it starts to become operational in my, in my practical life, in, in my relationships. It, begin, it begins to work like, like it should. You understand what I'm saying? I focus inward on who He is in me and who, on who I am in Him, that I'm, I'm in union with Him. He is one with me. Are you all still excited? So, Regardless, I, you know, I, I want to I plant this thought in you because um, regardless of what's going on around you, you have peace on the inside of you. Regardless of what goes on in the next week, the next month, the next three months, the next six months, you are overcomers. And you overcome because you have peace in your heart. Peace rules like an umpire, Colossians says. Peace rules in your heart like an umpire so that you can make decisions that will produce life and not death in your life and in the lives of the people around you. Let me, let me read uh, one more scripture and then I'm going to stop. Colossians 3. Verses 12 through 17. Out of the Message Bible. So chosen by God for this new life of love. 
dress and the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as completely and quickly as the master forgave you. And in reality, he didn't forgive you. He never needed to forgive you. I, I could have never have done anything that would have offended God, ever. I, I can't offend God. He didn't need to forgive me. I needed that language and that terminology so that I would forgive myself and forgive others. The reality is God never needed to do that to any of you. You were holy and blameless and righteous and accepted and beloved before time began, before you ever entered this earth realm. And besides that, Jesus died on the cross and rebooted the whole human race 2,000 years ago. We've been operating on another plane and just haven't known it. Regardless of what else you put on, wear love in your life. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other, in step with each other. None of this going off and doing your own thing. Cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your life, lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing. Sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your life, words, actions, whatever it is, be done in the name of the Master, Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. God is good. And we're going to pass to the other side. Is that okay that I prophesy this morning? We will pass to the other side in all of this election and all of this COVID stuff. It, we are going to pass to the other side. This is not going to be like this forever. Things are going to transform. Things are going to change because the body of Christ all over the planet is changing, is morphing, is coming into the understanding of the love of God like I have never seen before. And so I, my hope is, is that we here in this room are going to get, on, get in on that and be partnering with God to help bring the planet into the clarity that is continuing to come. And it is continuing to come. And it's continuing to come to everyone. 